Slava Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. First, I wanted to thank Father Anthony, Father Peter, Father Matthew, Natalie, and Oleg for, and everyone else who has been part of the preparations of this combined Lenten retreat, those of the Ukrainian Orthodox League and those of the American Carpathian Russian Youth, and so I thank you for working to put us together. I also wanted to thank everyone who is here as a participant today for choosing to be here instead of somewhere else. Plenty of things to do, but you chose this so that we could be together and we could share in worship as we did this morning in the chapel with fellowship and with learning. Now, I didn't know that Natalie was going to talk about Alaska, but since she did, I will start talking about Alaska. <laughs> In the year 2000, the first mission trip of the OCMC to Alaska needed 12 members. I applied. I was a lay person at the time, working in the hospital. I was in cardiovascular research. I said, I need a break. Let me take this trip to Alaska if possible. I submitted my paperwork, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And so one day I picked up the phone and I called the mission center. I talked to Andy Likos, who was the coordinator of these trips around the world. And I said, Andy, what's going on? I haven't heard anything. Well, we've picked everybody for the team, but we don't know what to do with you. <laughs> I said, Andy, what are you talking about? Well, on your application, you put down that you have an allergy to seafood. They eat a lot of fish there. A lot of salmon, breakfast, the snack, lunch, the afternoon snack, dinner, the evening snack, the midnight snack. It's all salmon. My baptismal name was George. He said, George, I, we don't know what to do with you. I said, okay, when are you going to know? He says, in about 48 hours, we're going to decide. We're working with a medical team. I said, what? <laughs> And so I decided that I was going to find out what else was being eaten in Alaska. So I went to their website, the government website for Alaska. I went to the village we were going to be in, and Napaskiak is the village on the Kuskokwim River. We were going to base there and then go up the river for one month visiting little Eskimo, Yupik Eskimo villages that were all Orthodox. And so I saw that for Napaskiak and all the villages on the Kuskokwim River, they ate moose, caribou, beaver, lots of fruits and vegetables. So I didn't wait for Andy to call me back. I called him. I said, Andy, moose, caribou, beaver, lots of fruits and vegetables. Okay, okay, you can go. And that's how I got on the trip that went to Alaska in 2000. And so it was a teaching trip. We went there to teach the little kids in the morning, the teenagers in the afternoon, and the adults at night, like a catechism, a Sunday school. They didn't have that. They were orthodox because Alaska used to belong to the Russians before they sold it to us in the 1860s. By that time, the Russian hunters had already come in, had already done their work, and were starting to fall in love with the local women. Some of them needed to get married instead of just living with her. And we had to baptize the kids that were being created because we were living with her. And so they asked for a priest. They sent them ten. Herman was one. And so that's how Alaska became an Orthodox territory. And of course, when the Russians sold it to us for, I think, two cents an acre, nice deal. <laughs> they wish they hadn't, but it's too late now. It belongs to us as United States. 
It's the 50, 49th, 50th state. 49th state. Well, it doesn't matter. Hawaii is with them. <laughs> Think of it. You know, Hawaii, paradise, Alaska, the frozen tundra. We got them both. And so I went that year. We were in the cathedral of the OCA there in Anchorage. We trained for three days before we went into the field. And we met the Yupik Eskimo priest who was from the other side, Father Nikolai Larson. He walked into the room. He looked at me and he goes, your name is Abanukbak. I said, what? He said, your name is Abanukbak. I said, Father, why do you call me Abanukbak? He is a mythical character in our mythology who is a very large guy. <laughs> and he did great things. And we call him the great warrior. I said, so you're calling me the great warrior? He says, yes. And so my name for that whole month was Abanukbak. And wherever we went, I was introduced as Abanukbak. And they knew why they called me Abanukbak. I wasn't the smallest on the team. I was the biggest on the team. <laughs> in height, in width. And so that's how I started in Alaska. The next year, I wasn't going to apply for the team. I was busy doing other stuff. Andy called me. And he said, Abanukbak. <laughs> I said, what, Andy? They want you back. I said, who wants me back? He says, the Alaskans are asking for you by name. They don't remember your secular name. They just remember Abanukbak. <laughs> and so I went back the second year in 2001 on the Yukon River. And we did the same kind of stuff with the villages along the way. The largest village, Napaskiak, had 400 people. The other villages, less than 100. But they were truly orthodox. And to be able to celebrate the liturgy in Yupik Eskimo, in Slavonic, in Greek, and in English was awesome. Really awesome. And so you started this conversation about Alaska. This was not part of what I was going to say, but they asked for Abba Nukbak. It turns out that the priest the second summer was the brother-in-law of the priest of the first summer. And that's how I got the invitation to go back to Alaska. If you've never been to Alaska, it is Truly amazing. Truly amazing. And I ate caribou, <laughs> moose, and beaver. And the beaver, I shot myself. Oh, it all tastes like chicken? It tasted just like chicken. <laughs> A banukbak. If you look at the schedule real quick, because we want to stay on it, because that's what we were told we had to do today. At 4 o'clock it says question and answers. You get one question, and then we'll come up with as many answers as we can for that question. Okay? Now I can put that away. I don't need that anymore. My talk is entitled, Engage the Call to Be a Disciple. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. The definition of discipleship. And passing along by the Sea of Galilee, Simon, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with hired servants and followed him. Mark 1, 16 to 20. Our topic is engaged, the call to be disciples. As we begin, let us look at the definition of discipleship. Here are a few thoughts. All of us are in different places when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. 
Some of us have solid relationships. Others perhaps hardly know who Christ is at all. The common denominator is that we have a desire to grow in the relationship, however solid or weak it may be at this very moment. Something else that we all have in common is that we're all called by Christ to be his disciples. When we think of the disciples, we think of Peter and Andrew, James and John, Paul, Timothy, Titus, and James. However, it is not only these biblical figures that Jesus has called to follow him and to become his disciples. He has called everyone who has ever lived to be his disciples. In fact, in the 21st century, you and I share that same call of 2,000 years ago. When we study the scriptures closely, we will come to understand that the Lord loved Andrew and Peter. He cherished his fellowship with them. We will also come to find that Andrew and Peter and the others were rather ordinary people doing rather ordinary things. Jesus did not go to the rabbinical schools to find his disciples. He went to the docks and he found mediocre fishermen. When he went to the tax office, he found Matthew. He found Philip under a tree. And to this day, he calls out all of us from where we are to follow him. The word disciple in Greek is mathitis. And while this also means pupil or student, it is a little broader than this. Mathitis refers to the mental effort needed to think about something all the way through. So disciples think things all the way through. The ultimate goal that Christ set for us was to go out and make disciples of all nations. The person who makes disciples is called an apostle. An apostle comes from the Greek word apostolo, which means to send out. But before one can be sent out to bring people to Christ, one has to know Christ. In other words, before one can be an apostle, one has to be a good disciple. Before one can commit his or her life to Christ, one has to learn who Christ is. So the first job of the disciple is to be a good student. To desire to learn who Christ is. Discipleship refers to the process of making other disciples. The word is generally not used in orthodox circles. Some will say that it's Protestant and a little off-putting. However, the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations extends to everyone who has ever lived. When it comes to discipleship, this is a role we're all called to play, a job for which we all bear responsibility. Unlike so many things in contemporary society that, have, that are solved with some kind of quick fix, becoming a disciple and hopefully later an apostle takes time. It takes time to learn. It takes time to desire to grow. It takes time to commit to follow. The first step in being a disciple is to commit some time to learn about Jesus Christ. So that one day the disciple is able not only to know, but to tell others about what he or she knows. We come to know Christ primarily through prayer through worship, through the scriptures, through acts of service. So, to be a disciple, you have to pray, you have to worship, you have to read the scriptures, and you have to give service to others. If you're not doing all four of those at some kind of more than just cursory level, you're not very much of a disciple. And so how can you talk about Christ to anybody? If, however, you know these things, you participate in these things, you are equipped not only to be a disciple, 
but to be an apostle. A conversion experience is required. Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd gathered about him, and he taught them. And as he passed one, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and he followed him. And as he sat at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Mark 2, 13 to 17. There is one drawback to orthodoxy. It is that we are never required to stand up and to proclaim that we believe and desire to belong. In the early church, those who wished to join were required to be catechumens for a period of two years. Catechumens were those who were learning about the faith and preparing to join the church. Two years is a long time. And by preparing for two years, those who joined the church were very vested and committed in following Christ and embracing the life of the Christian. The church began baptizing infants in the 8th century after a plague had gone through Europe, killing a large percentage of the population, so that there were many people who were not adults who perished before they could be baptized. At this point in history, the church changed its thinking on baptism and began baptizing, baptizing infants who were not required to prepare in any way to join the church. So, catechumen, not part of the process for the baby that we were able to teach. Who knows what God was teaching the child? Today, it is traditional for children to be baptized as infants. At the same time they are baptized, they are chrismated as Orthodox Christians and begin receiving Holy Communion. No one is required to read a book or take a class or stand up and proclaim, I believe! Or I want to belong, like the Protestants do. That's one thing we as Orthodox don't do. We never proclaim anything in front of people. We just are. Some of us are because we were born in a certain ethnic group that happened to be Orthodox. And so we're going to be Orthodox, baptized as children. We don't proclaim anything. Right? We all know this. Pick your cultural group of the Orthodox world. We all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thus, we have this idea that one is born Christian because he or she is a Christian shortly after birth. However, one cannot become a disciple by birth or baptism. At the heart of discipleship, the call to be a disciple is a choice, a response. Jesus called Levi, Matthew, at the tax office and he asks him to follow. And then he decides on his own to follow after Jesus. In like manner, Jesus asks all of us to follow. And it's up to each of us to answer that call. Even if we were requiring people to stand up and to proclaim that they belong, this choice is not a one-time choice. Rather, to follow Jesus, to be a disciple, is a daily choice. The call to be a disciple is a very personal call. And likewise, a daily conversion to Christianity, a daily choice to follow, is a very personal call. Each of us has to decide in our own heart, in our own soul, if we believe and if we will follow. On a daily basis. The call of Jesus is not for the crowd. Rather, it's very personal. Jesus didn't see crowds. He saw people. He picked people out of the crowd, like Zacchaeus or the blind man. That's because Jesus didn't see us 
as a bunch of people, but rather as individuals. He knows our names. He knows our needs. The choice to follow Jesus requires a daily conversion. A daily stating not only of how one believes or how one feels, but how one will act. How he or she will conduct himself or herself. The wonder and the awe. The next day again, John standing with his two disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. John 1, 35 to 39. How often do you feel in awe of something? Let's forget about the religious stuff for a minute. And just reflect. How often does the word awe come to you? To your mind? And in what circumstances do you feel awe? I feel awe at certain times in nature. I'm a biologist by training, so I love being out in the forest. You can imagine what Alaska was like for me. I was eating the moose, the caribou, the beaver. I have visited the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina many times. I'm from North Carolina, so it was an easy one for me. I feel a great sense of awe when I can see a waterfall and hear its thunderous roar. I feel in awe on a clear night when I can see more stars than I can count and realize how really small I am in the whole span of creation. And I feel in awe when I see someone using a special talent, someone who has a great voice, Someone who offers a moving speech. Sadly, most of life is rather mundane. I don't wake up every morning thinking and wondering or planning or experiencing anything that something is awesome. However, I know awesome when I see it. And I have the capacity to allow myself to feel in awe. I really wonder at what percentage of the population experiences something awesome and how often it happens. The examples I gave from the North Carolina mountains and the stars, by the way, Camp Nazareth, where we spend our summers in the Carpathian Russian Orthodox Diocese, is the clearest skies in Pennsylvania, I believe. I have a telescope there in my room that I use off my balcony, and we have five new telescopes that we purchased last summer for our science and nature week at camp. We don't just go there and do regular, science, uh, regular summer. We have one week that's science and nature. How could I not? I'm a biologist. I got 300 acres there. Paradise, our slice of paradise. I'm going to explore it scientifically with a group of kids. We had our first summer last year, and this year we hope to double the number of kids that are there. Because we're in awe of what we see. A great speech. These are all examples of positive awe. There's also negative awe. Most of us have experienced this. 9-11 is an example of negative awe. How many people can die in a single moment in a single place? That was awe. <laughs> The explosion of the space shuttle in 1986. The tsunami of 2004, 2011. These bring negative awe as we watch the events that seem so surreal. Whether positive or negative awe, it leaves us with an overwhelming exp experience of reverence, of astonishment, of loss for words. Awesome things are things we never forget. 
I still remember what I was doing when the space shuttle blew up in 1986. I was driving to graduate school for my job. I was on the interstate, and they said, this happened. It was a moment of awe. And then I saw the footage of the awe, negative awe. How can you forget? I can still have a remember the roar of the fall in the park. Being a disciple of Christ includes the gift of awe and wonder. To follow Christ causes fe feelings of awe. I've had several awe moments as a priest. Not all of them involve things of joy. Watching someone take their last breath, being in the room when the angels of God come to take a soul out of the body, that is awesome. You priest may have experienced this. You seminarians will definitely experience this. The moment of death is awesome. Enjoying the hands of a couple in marriage, watching someone come back in repentance in the sacrament of confession, listening to the sounds of a good choir, singing God's praises, standing in front of the altar and celebrating the liturgies, these are personal awe moments. We all have them. Now, if you're not a priest, you're not standing in front of the altar and having an awe moment, <laughs> unless you're in one of the Protestant denominations. You may be a female priest, but not in the Orthodox world. But as a lay person, you can be in church and have that awe moment. I confess that not, not every time is something awesome, but they should be. In my frailty, my, uh, my own mind is beset with distractions. Many times I miss the awesomeness of these moments. However, when I give myself entirely to God in these moments, I experience his awe in a profound way. This is not limited to the clergy, but to all of us. If you give yourself entirely to God, in those moments, you will experience awe in a profound way. Awesome things inspire an overwhelming feeling of reverence and astonishment and a loss for words. Awe inspires us. It motivates us. Awe is the beginning of the life of faith. Imagine the awe in the voice of John the Baptist when he told his two disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. How awesome must that have been for John. He was waiting for him. Even though he was his cousin, he was waiting for him to come to the River Jordan. That had to be an awesome moment for John to realize that his ministry was almost over. And the new ministry of Christ was just beginning. That's awesome. If a person visits the Great Smoky Mountains today... And in his hands, he's holding an iPhone or an iPod, never taking his eyes off the screen. He will miss the awe. He will never experience the awe. He will be in an awesome place, but he'll never experience the awe because he is distracted. God is all around us in nature, in others, in us. But many times we miss the awe because we are distracted. In a few minutes, we'll be discussing silence and prayer and worship and other ways to experience the awe of God. Part of it, however, involves us in our ability to focus without distraction. For the awe of God is there for everyone to experience. This is a distractor. A major distractor. The Linton challenge for my diocese this year was to turn it off one hour every day. Just turn it off. One hour. And not an hour when you were asleep, but <laughs> one hour during the day. And someone would say, but Bishop, what if there's an emergency? Come on. 
How many emergencies have occurred in the last 30 years because you had your phone off for an hour? None. And if it's a real emergency, they will find you. And if not, the hour will pass, you'll turn it on, and you'll see the emergency. You probably can't fix it anyway. It doesn't matter. But you can really be bold, I said, if you can turn it off for two hours. And then I said, if you really, really want to be not distracted, when you go home in the afternoon after dinner, turn it off till breakfast. Don't worry. It'll be fine. All your messages will be there. All your Facebook pace will be there. All your Instagrams will be there. All your Twitter stuff from the president will be there. It won't go anywhere. It's a beautiful device. It has more computing power than all the computers NASA used to put a man on the moon in 1969. More. And we have put it in the hands of our children. Are we nuts? Have we lost our minds? They can sit in their bedroom at night and launch the space shuttle with this. And the space shuttle's been out of service for eight years now in a museum. They'll launch it from the museum. And you won't know anything about it until the next morning. And the government is looking for your child. Don't applaud me. Just turn it off occasionally. It's a great distractor. Really and truly. What did we do before we had these things? They've only been around for like 10 years. I mean, come on. And you're going to pay $1,000 for one? Are you crazy? Come to me. We will excise the demon of the phone 10 or X or 1,000, whatever they call it today. I will tell you of thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the songs of Jacob glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you sons of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the, afflicted, the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hid his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Psalm 22, 22 to 24. God is awesome. If you don't believe that, start believing it. He's just awesome. Doesn't matter what society is telling us. Oh, he doesn't exist. Really? Seriously. All of this exists because of a big bang. You must be out of your mind. <laughs> What Big Bang allowed us to be like this? One molecule, the DNA, double helix, base pairs lined up. Life is not a random act. They tell us that there was this very dense energy in a point sometime in the past. It just was there. It doesn't say how it got there. It's there. And then all of a sudden it went, whew. And over millions and millions and billions of years, we got this. Really. Seriously. Did you notice how I was holding that energy? Does this sound familiar? Look familiar. That energy is held by the Trinity. And the Big Bang is when God went, And then we got this. It is the awesomeness of God that created what we have. I'm a scientist. Sometimes it says there's a conflict between science and faith and religion. No, there's not. If I look in a microscope, one little drop of water of a pond somewhere, I will see animals and I will see plants. I will see one-celled organisms. I'll see a paramecium, you know, going around like this, a little flapping of its, you know, cilia and stuff. It's a whole universe in that drop. Please do not tell me it got there because there was a big bang somewhere. 
Now, the Big Bang Theory can be a, kind of a funny show if you watch it on TV. <laughs> but that's another story for another time. God is awesome. What must it have been like? While people pressed upon him, Jesus heard the word of God. Upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the sea. But the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish, and their nets were breaking but they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. Henceforth you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Luke 5, 1 through 11. One of the things that we may lack when we read scriptures is an imagination. We read about the life and ministry of Jesus and it's hard to imagine the hot sun, the dusty streets, the worn faces of the beggars, the desperation of the blind man. It's also hard to imagine the scene at the dock of the lake of Gennesaret as Jesus approached Simon, James, John and called them to be his disciples. It's so hard to comprehend what this might have looked like. It's tempting just to brush it aside and not give much thought about it. After all, most of us are not fishermen, and we do not hang out at the dock taking care of our fishing nets. Here is where we miss the whole point of the story. Jesus called the fishermen just as they were, doing what they are doing, he walked in on them at their jobs, in their place of business, and he called them. Can you imagine the Lord walking in on you in your place of business, in your home, or while you're working on your hobby? Can you imagine the Lord coming next to you on the golf course and asking, can I play a round of golf with you? <laughs> it's really hard to conceive of this. However, the Lord doesn't meet us where we are. If the, the, the Lord doesn't meet with us where we are, the Lord doesn't meet Peter. James and John on their turf, they would never have followed him. Never. They would never have known him. Jesus met them where they were and how they were, and he led them to him. He comes to you and he tells you, follow me. That's it. Two words. Drop whatever you're doing and follow. Just like those fishermen. Just like that tax collector. It is interesting to note that Jesus did not go to the rabbinical schools, as I said before, to call his disciples. He didn't call, go and call the very religiously educated people. He went and he called ordinary people doing ordinary things to follow him. He calls ordinary people in ordinary circumstances. Jesus calls you and I in our circumstances to follow him. Whether you have been religious your whole life, 
or you've made a mess of your life, Jesus is calling you. Whether you've read the whole Bible cover to cover, or you've never opened it at all, Jesus is calling you. And whether you come to church every Sunday or infrequently, Jesus is calling you. And whether he is the center of your life or you don't know him at all, Jesus is still calling you. When Jesus called the, shepherd, the, the fishermen, he didn't call them for their knowledge of religion or scripture. He didn't call them even because they were experts in their field, fishing. The Gospels are quick to note that they weren't even very good fishermen. <laughs> Every time he asked, they had nothing to offer. <laughs> Throw your net! We did all night. We caught nothing. Throw your net! <laughs> okay. And then the nets are breaking. And enough for both boats to be filled with fish. And now the weight is sinking the boats. Man, that's got to be awesome for you. Some guy shows up and he says, throw the net. And you do. And he proves you totally incompetent as a fisherman. Because <laughs> you fished all night, had nothing. And fishing at night was the better part of the day. For the 24 hours to fish. Christ says, throw it out now with the sun. Oh, there's no way. Oh, yes, there is way. Because each time he encountered them, they had caught nothing. But Jesus saw something in the hearts of these men that he had called. He called, they answered. They stumbled a whole lot at the beginning. But they became saints of the church. In the same way Christ is calling us. No matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter what we've done in the past... Jesus is calling all of us to come to him. We will talk about what it means to come to Jesus in a minute. For now, I just want you to meditate on the word come. This is the first word of Christ's invitation. It is simply to come. Imagine Christ is calling you today where you are, as you are. A call to be something. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. John 1, 46, 43 to 49. How many invitations have you had in your life to come and be something? Think for a moment. I was invited to be on a soccer team in high school. Except it would be more accurate to say I was invited to belong to a soccer team <laughs> for a couple of seasons. I haven't been on a soccer team in almost 40 years and 150 pounds lighter. <laughs> I was good back then. <laughs> I would not say that today. I was invited to attend college. I was invited as a teenager to work in a furniture factory. And I was also invited or voluntold 
by my father, you will come to the restaurant this weekend. <laughs> okay, Dad. The only thing we can truly be in life is a follower of Christ. Or be a non-believer. Because this choice, and this choice alone, is what we follow for eternity. We're either going to be with God forever, or we're going to be apart for him, from him forever. In 100 years, I'm not going to be a homeowner. I'm not going to be a tax collector. Taxpayer, sorry, I don't collect taxes. I'm not going to be a resident of Johnstown. And I'm not going to be given talks at Linton retreats. Or any other thing that I can describe as me being something. As for being, I hope that God will consider me to be one of his children in this life and for eternal life. That's it. If I can just be one of his kids, living with him forever, I've achieved what I want. That's my number one goal in life. Paradise, salvation. If your goal is not paradise or salvation, change it right now. Your goal should not be the most beautiful wife, the most handsome husband, the biggest house with three cars for the garages, gold, a 401k to kill for. That is not your number one goal. That can be goal like two through ten. Number one is paradise. If you don't achieve that, you have nothing. You're going to die one day, and they're going to put you in a box. That might be a $2,000 box, might be a $5,000 box, might be a $10,000 box. It's a box. Get the cheapest one. It is not your responsibility to educate the children of the undertaker. Get the cheapest box. Be like Billy Graham. Billy Graham was buried in a wooden box made 10 years ago by prisoners in Louisiana that cost them $100. $100. And if we were smart, we would also be buying our wooden boxes from prisoners in Louisiana, but we would be smarter than Billy Graham. We would buy them in bulk and get them at $85 a piece. <laughs> Nothing will fit in that box but you. You can't take anything with you. And so getting to that point at the end of paradise is really the only thing that matters. That's it. That really is it. The call of Christ for us today is the same. Just come. Come and be something. Come and be the one thing that we can truly be forever. A call to be a friend. Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, 13 to 16. The first call of Jesus was not to go and do incredible things or even to do things. It was simply to be with him. The call to be a disciple is a call to be a friend with Christ. Calling Jesus a friend is something that's very foreign to us as Orthodox Christians. The word friend seems to be a little too casual of a content. We hang out with our friends. We cut up and laugh with our friends. 
if we believe that Jesus is calling us in the same way that he called his first disciples, his first call to them was one of friendship. He didn't call them and say, hey, come and worship me or be my servant. He called them friends. This would seem to make sense. So let's talk about building a friendship with someone, anyone. The first thing we do with any relationship is respect someone so that they feel safe around us. The second thing is to invest time, to communicate, to find things that we share in common. And after time and communication comes the ability to be vulnerable, after which comes trust. And then love grows from that. We don't tell someone that we don't know or just met that we love them. We don't show vulnerability to people we don't know. So, seminarians, as you start to move into the world looking for a wife, please do not find the first woman and say, I love you. <laughs> Relax. Develop a friendship first. You will scare her off. She goes, he wants me to be the wife of a priest, and already he loves me? I'm running away. <laughs> I had to take a shot at you guys. Okay, if you, it's like love at first sight, you're dreaming, but it's okay. For those who think it's too casual to call Christ a friend, there is an ekphonesis, a liturgical phrase, which praises God, and that is used in several services. Then in Greek it says, Oti agathos ke philanthropos theos iparchis, which translates, you are a good and friend of man, God. That's not exactly the translation. We usually say something like, for you are a good and loving God, or you are a merciful and loving God. However, the word philanthropos is made up of two Greek words. Philos, which means friend. Anthropos, which means man or mankind. If we call Christ a philanthropos, in Greek, it is totally appropriate to call him a friend of man or a friend. In John 15, Jesus calls his disciples, my friends. This discourse is giving at or right after the Last Supper before Jesus was arrested and crucified. And he continues on, I have called you my friends. And says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We lack the imagination to put ourselves at the table with Christ of the Last Supper to hear those words being spoken to us just as they were spoken to the disciples nearly 2,000 years ago. On Holy Thursday, think that you're at the table. Think that you're one of the twelve and not the Judas one, <laughs> but one of the other eleven. Put yourself in their place. They were disciples. You are a disciple. Jesus then tells them the greatest expression of friendship is to die for a friend. Greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus went out and he did that very thing. He laid down his life for his disciples, his friends. For us, his friends. He asks that we also put him first in our lives and that we lay down our lives for him. It's a two-way street. Now going back to being friends, we love to spend time with our friends. We look for extra opportunities to be together. We should treat God with that same joy which we treat our friends, cherishing our time together, looking for extra opportunities to be together in prayer and worship, like Lent. Extra services. 
be there. We don't have it just so the priest can show up and unlock. It's to be there. That's why we have services all through Lent. To get closer to Christ. To get closer to God. To get closer and to be friends. Lord, you have granted us to offer these common prayers in unison and have promised that when two or three agree in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the petitions of your servants as may be of benefit to them, granting them in the present age the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life. For you, O God, are good and love mankind. Philanthropos. And you... We offer up glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. God is not only our maker and our Lord. He is man's best friend. Accepting the invitation, will you be with me? Jesus went up the mountain and called those he desired, and they came to him. Mark 3.13 for those of you who are married, can we remember the day that you became engaged? I don't think most guys give a long speech about specific hopes, dreams, and details. And if so, I don't think that most girls would remember if they did. <laughs> the gist of what gets said is, will you be with me? I want to be with you. Let us build a life together. Getting engaged didn't mean building a life together at that moment in time. It was a commitment to be together and to build that life. We don't have wedding vows per se in the Orthodox Church. But most of us are familiar with them from the movies and from our Protestant friends. Husbands and wives vow to be together for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer and poor, etc., etc., etc. The commitment to be together transcends good times and bad times, joyful times and sad times, times of marital bliss and times of marital strife. The invitation of Christ is akin to a marriage proposal. He desires to share himself with us, to intertwine himself in our lives, so that we can be intertwined with him for eternal life. Number one goal, paradise. Our relationship with Christ is supposed to transcend the good times, the bad times, the joyful times, the sad times, the times of bliss, the times of strife. Whether or not we are materially rich, Christ desires for us and enables us to be spiritually rich. And unlike the line in the vows that say, until death do us part, we know that at that moment of our earthly life, we can be even closer to Christ. For the date of our death, for the devout Orthodox Christian or just Christian, is the day we enter into the life of his kingdom. Billy Graham told him, don't weep for me when I die. I will be closer to the Lord that day. He wanted to be with God. He wanted to be with Christ. Do we not? When we die, don't we want to be ultimately with the Lord? Of course we do. And that's why you see people who are ready to die smiling on their deathbed. Not frantic. Not worried because those are the ones that are not ready. They're afraid to meet the Lord. But the ones who are ready, they're just smiling. They got that goofy smile. They're dying. You see the monitor going flatline. <laughs> How about those Coptic Christians on the beach in Libya being ready to have their heads cut off and they're smiling? Not the executioner. He was hiding behind a mask, those cowards. But the ones on their knees, praying to the Lord, singing hymns of the church, smiling because their Lord was going to be with them very soon. 
Who cares about anything else? To be at that state is what you work for. For those who are happily married, okay, none of you. I mean, I thought someone would raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm happily married. Thank you, Lord, for not giving me a wife. Come on. Really? For those of you who are happily married, now raise your hand. I still don't see a lot. We know that there's one ingredient to a happy marriage, and that's to give the greatest loyalty to your spouse. First ahead of everything else to your spouse. And when we're with our spouse, the person that we say we love, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We're happy just being together. Being in the same room. Sharing the same space. <laughs> of course, it goes without saying that we should put our greatest loyalty in our first place to the Lord. And the second should be to our spouse. Our lives should revolve around Christ rather than trying to have Christ around us. Christ should be the center and we should be around him. And just as you are with your spouses, whom we are happy to be with, we should have the same joy when we're being with the Lord. We don't need to necessarily do anything. Just be with the Lord. There's a short little story in the book Beginning to Pray by Archbishop Anthony Bloom. He writes this. There's a story of an old peasant who used to spend hours and hours sitting in the chapel, motionless, doing nothing. The priest said to him, what are you doing all these hours? And the old peasant said, I look at him, he looks at me, and we're happy. That's awesome. That's awesome. That someone is sitting in the chapel just looking at the icons. And the icons are looking at him or her. And they're happy. The icons are happy. The person is happy. That's being together. It's so beautiful how the peasant takes delight in just being with the Lord. We do everything so darn fast. It seems that we breeze through everything. That we have a hard time slowing down and just being we're all in some kind of running mode. The first invitation of God to his disciples wasn't to run or to work or to do anything, but just to be. Just stop and share his company. Put it away. <laughs> That's not here, but it came to me. It doesn't matter what's said, how it's said, or that it's even said. We're supposed to take delight in just being in the mere presence of God. That's awesome. In the presence of God. Those who are happily married to their spouses know that the invitation to share a life is one that is answered daily. Am I correct? Amen. Yep, they say. Amen. It's a commitment that's renewed daily. It's renewed with time and with care and with intimate closeness. The same thing is true with our relationship with God. It's not a one-time commitment. We have to renew it daily. It's renewed with time, with care, with intimate closeness, found in prayer, in stillness, in worship, in the Holy Eucharist. It is renewed through acts of kindness and charity, a sense of love for God and an expression of love for our neighbor. Before we begin each day, diving into our opportunities and our challenges, we have to remember the invitation of the Lord. Will you come today? 
will you be with me today? Accept the invitation to be with Christ today and forever. The invitation is for everyone. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. Psalm 149 verse 4. In our modern world, there are two interpretations for invitations that are offered. If only a select few are invited to something, accusations of favoritism and elitism follow. If everyone is invited to something, then there are platitudes about dummying everything down in political correctness. Everyone's a winner. Pressure to include everybody. At the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, I don't remember the game, I don't care. That was two years ago. But I remember the commercial, which is more important in Super Bowls. That's why they pay $5 million for 30 seconds. <laughs> They're nuts. <laughs> but it was this image of a young African-American child with his father walking to their car. And the little kid had a trophy. He was so excited that he had a trophy. And the father looked at the trophy as they got to the car. And it said, participant. And the father ripped it off. And he wrote, champion. The kid didn't participate. He was on a championship team. He deserved a trophy. Nobody else deserved a trophy. But in our society, the last 15 or 20 years, you participate on a sport, you get a trophy. Really? Is that what life is? Collecting little trophies? Do you know that I played sports my whole life? All the way through high school. Little league, soccer, you name it. Football, everything. I got one trophy at home. It's this tall. <laughs> it's a little baseball player swinging the bat. And on it, it says champion of whatever year it was. I wasn't playing. I was coaching. And we had one trophy left over. And I got to keep it. <laughs> That's my only trophy in life. Because I never won anything in life at the sports level. I participated. Now, if they had given me a trophy for participating, we'd have to have a bookshelf of participation trophies. You don't get a trophy for just showing up. You get a trophy for competing and being the best. That's the same thing with us as Christians. Just showing up is not enough. Saying you're a Christian is not enough. Acting sort of like a Christian is not enough. Participating and winning is what it's all about. Paradise is for winners, not for participants in the battle. Now, I don't know what that level of winner is. That's Christ's job. But we're not all going to get to paradise unless Christ is really having a great day. <laughs> and says, ah, yes, everybody, let's go. You know, hamburgers, hot dogs for everybody, let's go. Dad is waiting for us. We're all prodigals, let's go, let's go. Come on, like sheep. I don't think it's going to be that. It's going to be the winners. So we have to fight to be the winner. It's not in my notes, it just came to me, okay? <laughs> Actually, I know who lost the Super Bowl two years ago. It was my Carolina Panthers, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> the call to disciples is for everyone, even for those who have screwed up things. If you are living, there is no sin which you cannot commit, from which you cannot repent. If you're alive, there's hope for you. An extreme example of repentance 
a mass killer. Most people don't want to think about there's hope for salvation for people like this who have committed heinous crimes. I personally believe that those should have no hope of freedom. They should be left in jail until they die. I do believe, however, that they have a chance for salvation. Everyone has a chance for salvation. There's no crime that you cannot repent from. But you have to live out your life with a call to be a disciple, even in your prison cell. Ideally, as Christians, we are to pray for the salvation of all. Not necessarily for the freedom of all, but for the salvation of all. I pray for that kid in Florida that he'll make it to paradise. But I don't want him out of jail until he's dead. There's a difference there. Okay? There's a difference of a heinous crime, punishment for that, and then salvation at the end. Who am I to say who should be in paradise and who should not? Everyone should be in paradise. We all should be there. There are 7 billion of us on the planet right now. National Geographic a couple years ago said there are 105, 108 billion have already survived prior to us. That's 115 billion people all in front of Christ one day to be judged. As far as you can see, there will be people. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord said, enter the kingdom, and there's no one left? I don't believe that's going to be the case. But I don't know. On the other hand, he may say to all of us, just go to hell. <laughs> None of you come. None of you are worthy. I don't think that's the case either. So somewhere in the middle, some will make it to paradise. But I don't know who. But as a shepherd of the church, it's my job to lead you to paradise. It doesn't matter what jurisdiction you are. You are a soul I have encountered. I am responsible for your soul to lead you, to bring you to the gates of paradise. And if I can't get in, I don't get in. But my job is to get you there. That's the job of every shepherd. The bishop shepherds and the priest shepherds. So seminarians realize that you have a lot in front of you. But you were called by God. He knew you were going to be a priest before you were conceived in your mother's womb. That's awesome. That's an awesome power of God. And he didn't lead you to seminary just to be there and then to fail. He led you there to make mistakes throughout your life, but to lead people to paradise. That's your job. It's a big one. Awesome. Your judgment day will be tougher than the regular people because you have all the souls in front of you. Take it serious. Second time I took a zinger at y'all. But I want you to be tough. Not wolves, but tough. In Matthew 22, we see that Jesus tells the parable of the wedding banquet. Many are invited, and when the time came for the marriage feast, the king who was offering the banquet sent his servants to gather the guests, and many of the guests made excuses not to come. In fact, some of the guests were even kill killed the servants who went to greet them. And to invite them. The king was very angry and he sent his servants to bring anyone who could, who could they find into the feast. And one man who was there who did not have a wedding garment, the king ordered him thrown out. The parable concludes with the phrase, many are called but few are chosen. It would not be a stretch to interpret this as many were called but few chose to accept the invitation. You're being called by Christ. You either accept the invitation or you reject the invitation. It's one or the other. It's your choice. Pick. And then deal with your choice.
In the parable, the king is Christ. The servants are the original disciples. But really, all the disciples, including you and me. Many of the invited guests refuse the invitation. Being a disciple means accepting the invitation to attend and also being one of those who will share the message to extend the invitation to others. Being a disciple isn't easy, as we can see from the servants who were shamed or killed in that parable. The reward, the reward is at being at the banquet with the king in the kingdom. The invitation is to come and be. Christ is inviting you to his banquet today and every day for eternity. Will you be one of the ones who choose to accept the invitation? Do you have a thirst for God? When we're thirsty, we feel the need to consume liquids. Sometimes on a hot day, we drink a glass of water and we find that we're still thirsty. Perhaps we have a second glass and then we feel satisfied and we're no longer thirsty. If someone comes to us in that moment and says, are you thirsty? Would you like something else to drink? You would say, no, I'm satisfied. There are moments in life when I definitely feel thirsty for something to drink. And there are moments in life when I'm not thirsty. I've even had moments where I was full of liquid because I miscalculated and I drank too much water. And that I feel I'm overfilled and drinking any more will really be a negative. Psalm 22, 42 says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. We need to ask ourselves, do we thirst for God? If we go to the example above, do we feel parched in need for God to quench that parched feeling in us? Do our hearts, souls, minds, and lives feel the need to be quenched by the grace that comes from God? Do we feel satisfied as if we've had enough of God? Or do we continually desire more of Him? Healthcare experts have long weighed into the need of drinking water to maintain health and vitality. Some say that we should drink half our body weight in ounces each day. In other words, there is a prescribed healthy dose that we should drink each day. So if you weigh 150 pounds, 75 ounces of water or Gatorade, or orange juice, or beer. <laughs> Maybe not. Spiritual health experts also prescribe the need to drink in God's love through prayer each day. Though there isn't a prescribed amount of prayer required for the healthy soul, it is certainly more than just a passing thought. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's not enough. It's okay, even a hundred times during the day, but that's not enough. You still are going to be thirsty for God. I know some physically healthy people who actually set an alarm to remind them to drink water throughout the day. Yeah, that's a crazy little device. It'll ping every time you need to drink something. Spiritually healthy people have an internal alarm which tells them that they're in a need for a state of prayer. When people don't have water for several hours, they don't need someone to remind them to drink water. They feel thirsty, as well as potentially lethargic and maybe even lightheaded. Feel sick. They go eagerly to satisfy their thirst and they bring back a sense of balance in their lives. People who thirst for God when they don't communicate with him for many hours, they don't need to be reminded. They feel a spiritual thirst and quickly go to prayer to be with God, 
to restore the balance in their souls. You ever notice how monks and nuns are constantly saying the Jesus prayer silently on their lips? Silently, all the time. Their lips are moving. No matter what they're doing, they're praying. They feel that need for prayer because they are thirsty all the time. We should be like that. Ideally, our souls thirst for God often. The good disciple cannot get enough of God. He always thirsts for more. The good disciple seeks to, seems, seeks to know God on a deeper and deeper level. The good disciple also does not get scared when he or she gets older. Rather, there's a joy coming, comes from knowing that the hour when they will come and behold the face of God is getting closer and closer. St. Athanasius in the 4th century said, Remember the day of your death. You will meet your maker. Always have to be ready. Many healthy people measure out an amount of water every day and they carry it around in some kind of water bottle making sure that by the end of the day they have consumed what is in the water bottle. And when they have consumed the water that they packed, they can rest assured that they have taken in a healthy portion of liquid. Their lives, their organs, their fluid levels stay healthy and they're in balance. Spiritual people have a set way to pray each day. They offer prayers in the morning, some in the evening, and throughout the day. They have a plan to go to God in prayer throughout the day. When they have set with God in prayer at intervals throughout the day, they can rest assured that they have taken in a healthy portion of God each day. Their lives, their hearts, their souls stay spiritually healthy and in proper spiritual balance. Out of the depths I cry to thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If thou, O Lord, shoutest mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou makest, mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the evening. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is steadfast love, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Psalm 130. Drink in God throughout the day with a healthy amount of prayer. And all of this begins because we have a thirst for God. We're almost done. <laughs> God's intention in creating mankind. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In, Im in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Period. Please do not tell me that there are 37 different labels for the sexuality of human beings. There is not that was created by God. Man, in his infinite wisdom, is now parsing us down to all kind of labels of our sexuality. We are trying to be gods. We will lose that battle. All we do is separate ourselves. And it says he created man, male and female. Man is humanity. We're all human beings. What are we doing to ourselves? 
National Geographic, last February, not this one, last one, had an issue on sexuality. And there was a centerfold there of about 15 or 20 young people. And I was supposed to try to figure out who they were and put a label on them. What? Really? Seriously? We are males and females. Now, are there variations in those two? Because of whatever reasons that I can't explain, psychological, biological, environment, I don't know. Although I'm a biologist, I should know. That's not what God said. I'm on God's team. I might not be a good player, but I'm on God's team. Don't allow the godless society to carve us up into little subgroups that then are offended every time the other 36 members can't somehow do you. And so we're doing like this, fighting constantly among ourselves. For what? Who wins when we're divided? Whose name in Greek means division? The avolos, the divider. He gets between man and God, between man and man, man and his children, man and his wife, man and his neighbor, man and his co-worker, man and his schoolmates, man and the rest of the people in his city, his state, his country, the world. What are we doing? We are one entity. Humanity. And he never says anything about color here. He just says males and females. Period. The rest is irrelevant to God or he would have said something. He didn't. That's not here either. Sorry. If I offended anyone, it was not my intent. But I'm not politically correct. I'm not. I try to follow God's word. Why did God create us? Perhaps this question is best understood when we answer the question, why do we create children? You parents, why did you create children? <laughs> no one who absolutely hates his or her life would ever bring a child into the world. We bring children into the world because we have at least some love of life and some love of love. We want to bring children into the world so that they can have life and experience love. We do not bring children into the world to fail and to suffer, even though many of them will fail and many will suffer. We bring them into the world with the hopes that they will succeed and do well. We also know, however, that they have free will and they may choose not to succeed despite our best efforts to encourage them. God existed as Trinity from the beginning of time. God is uncreated. God created everything that was created. We see this in Genesis 1, 1 to 3, where we read in the beginning... And then it says here, notice that the Bible intentionally does not say a period of time, just in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's your bang. God created refers to the Father. The Spirit of God refers to the Holy Spirit. And God said refers to the Word of God, who would later become the incarnate as Jesus Christ. The Trinity existed forever. It existed in a state of perfect love, perfect union, perfect oneness. God chose to create out of a sense of love and a desire to share his love with the world that he would create. 
He created us because he loves us. He wanted to express his love to an entity, humanity, male and female. That's why he created us. He doesn't need us. We need him. Because he had created all the other animals. But he needed one specifically that he could love. And it's us. He created mankind in his image, in his likeness. He created man to experience love as no other creature that had been created could experience it. He created man with a soul, a God-like feature that is from the beginning and the ending of every human life. The soul is placed into the human being at conception by the Lord. And now, after the fall, the soul is housed in the body until the time that the body undergoes a physical death. And at that point, the soul returns to God for judgment. Do you know, my people, that the priest has a prayer in his prayer book for the moment of death to pray at that moment of separation of soul and body? Did you know that? It exists, that prayer. That's why you have to call the priest when someone's dying. If someone dies in their sleep, you don't call the undertaker first. You call the priest. Let him come. Let him say the prayer. And then call the, whoever you need to call after that. But if you call the undertaker and they take the body away from wherever it is, already the location is different. Now maybe the priest can't come at that moment. Call him anyway and tell him, you know, my mother died. He will pray for her right there, wherever he is. So, my dear seminarians, you always carry your prayer book with you. Wherever you are, you're hiking in the woods. Take it with, look, not your cell phone. It'll die after one day of no battery recharging. The book, the book. It's all on there, but if it dies, sir, you have nothing. <laughs> oh, Lord, recharge my cell phone. <laughs> There's not a prayer for that. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. <laughs> God created us to be with him, to exist in communion with him, to love one another as God experiences love. In Genesis 1.30 it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. At the end of that time of creation of man, it was very good. At the end of the other five days, it was just good. But when man was created, it was very good. This is the only time in the creation account that we will read the word very. Because only after the human being was created was the creation very good. For mankind is the crowning jewel of God's creation. The only creatures to have a soul. The only creatures to have a soul. I didn't say dogs don't go to heaven. They just don't have a soul. Cats, we know where they're going. <laughs> No, no. Prostacato, down. <laughs> Forget it. Don't try to convince me. I had lots of cats growing up. They were all demonic. <laughs> God did not create us to fail, but to succeed. He created us to live in communion with him, with one another, to love one another as he loves us. The image of love is why we were created, and the image that God intended us to have. The image was disturbed and disrupted by the fall of mankind. We don't think of ourselves often as being created in the image and likeness of God. But think of this phrase and conform your life to trying to fulfill it. Because it is a blessing 
that we were created in the image and likeness of God. We are in perpetual communion with him if we take it serious. Paradise, our number one goal. And the Lord God planted a garden in Edom in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. Genesis 2, 8. And the man and his wife were both naked and unashamed. Genesis 2, 25. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Genesis 3, 8. Have you ever wondered what heaven is like? I'm sure you have. I've heard this question discussed many times. And more often than not, the answers are very secular in their nature. My golf game will be much improved in heaven. <laughs> the bars never close in heaven. And Uncle Louie, who's a little crazy, will probably be hanging out with all his poker buddies. These are answers that I hear sometimes. Have you ever really taken a moment to really think about what it's going to be like? Those three verses expanded. In Genesis 2.8, we read that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and there he planted the man he created. In other words, God created a special place for the man he created. He created a special place where they could walk together. We'd never be in want of anything. A paradise. Imagine sharing your home with God. In Genesis 2.25, it speaks of after the woman being created, and it says, The man and his wife were both naked and unashamed. This means that not only were they unashamed around each other, but that Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed before God. Not only does nakedness refer to physical beauty, it refers to a certain level of openness with God. In walking around, man didn't have to cover his body. In speaking with God, man could speak freely to God. As if he was talking to a friend. Yeah, I'm in Keros, okay? I'm not in Kronos. I'll explain that in a minute. There was no need to cover up or to say anything untruthful. The third verse from Genesis 8.3 says, It was of note, and it describes, that God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God walks in the garden looking for Adam and Eve who have hid themselves after they ate of the apple. And we understand that God walked with Adam and Eve, or rather they walked with him in the garden in the cool of the day, and they were naked and unashamed until the day of the fall when they found themselves ashamed. Adam and Eve shared a friendship with God. They walked with him, they talked with him, they were unashamed with him. They had a divine fellowship with God. And this was the state of mankind before the fall. And then he fell. Can you imagine Adam and Eve? They got it all. They're sitting in the middle of this beautiful garden. With no want. They needed nothing. And God only asked a couple of things of them. Just trim up the trees when it's time to trim. <laughs> but don't touch this tree. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree. Because if you do, you'll surely die. And they're fine. And then one day, the serpent comes into the garden. And he has a conversation with Eve. First mistake, Eve... Don't talk to the devil. She didn't know, but she was talking to the devil. Did he say that you would die if you ate of this fruit? Yes, that's what he told us. No, you will not die. You will live. You'll be like God. 
And so she had from the fruit a bite. And then she went to find her husband, Adam. And like all good husbands, whatever your wife offers you, you have to eat it. <laughs> and she offered the fruit. And he ate from the fruit. And then they realized they were naked. And all of a sudden, here comes God in the cool of the day, walking in paradise, looking for his two children. Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? Adam, I'm over here, Lord. What are you doing over there? We're hiding in the woods. Why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the fruit of the tree? God knew. He's God. This is a critical moment for Adam and Eve. Adam's response was, that woman that you sent me. <laughs> what? I sent you a helpmate and you're now blaming me for sending her that gave you the apple? Surely you jest. Woman, what have you done? That snake that you sent me, what? I sent the snake? And so it's my fault that you had the apple and then gave it to your husband? Not taking responsibility for their mistake. If, like good children, they had both said, we made a mistake, Lord. We remember that you told us not to eat from the fruit of the tree. But we did anyway because we were tempted. Can you forgive us just this once? I believe God would have forgiven them. I also believe that the devil would have found another way to tempt them in the future. The failure of man was going to come at some point. It's just who we are. But they didn't take responsibility. You have to take responsibility. Isn't that what you tell your children? The ones that you love because you like to be terrorized all the time? <laughs> yes, Father Michael, I'm talking about yours. And I know yours. <laughs> They're beautiful children. How they came from you, I'll never understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God they favored their mother. <laughs> We're in a spiritual battle. It will not end until Christ returns, and then he'll take the challenge to the ones that are fighting against us. But as disciples, believers of Christ, we have to engage the Lord. We've got to be who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. Quit acting like we're Christians in name and actually be Christians of action. Doing those things that we know we're supposed to do. The things that our mother, our grandmother taught us in the past and that we're trying to teach our kids, we have to actively engage the faith. Or we'll never make the goal. We'll never make it to paradise. And certainly you want to get there. Because in paradise, there's God, Christ, Panagia, your guardian angel, your patron saint, all the other saints, and all the good people that you've known in your life in the past that you say, they must be in paradise, or they're going to be in paradise. Or you can be in hell, where there's no God, no Christ, no Panagia, no patron saint, no guardian angel, only bad angels, the demons, and everybody else that went to hell. Where do you want to be? Because it's dark, cold, and there's pain, sorrow, suffering, tears, rotting meat, stench, death there. I don't want to go there. I want to go to the other place that's bright, warm. There are no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, only praises to God. Pick and then work towards that. No guarantees. You can't like check off a bunch of stuff on the list and go, I'm in. No. You could blow it the last day. Or you could be blowing it your whole life and be like the thieves on the cross. 
One mocking Christ and the other one asking him to remember him in his kingdom. Today you will be in paradise, he said. He didn't say it that way. I'm sure he said it a loving way. But today, not a year from now, not 10,000 years from now, not a million years. Today. And he was a miserable wretch. But at the last moment, he accepted the Lord. The only thing is you never know if you'll get that chance. You never know. Life could end and you're going, oh, I didn't really think I would die that way. And through 